Okay. So let's move to today's topic. So before going to buckling, if I have a column like this with a certain cross section, with a certain length, if I applied compression, and after applying compression, this element remains straight, it doesn't have any weird shapes, that's when we can, move, we can use the equations that you, we used before in lecture one and lecture two for the yielding, which is whether we have this column or we have, for example, this beam, but both of them, they are in compression. Before what we did, if we want to find the stress, we would say stress is equal to P over area. And to know whether this stress is safe or unsafe, we would compare it with something we call the yield. And where we get the yield from? From the stress strain curve. Which is something like this. And this will be the yield. So if the stress, which is force over area we calculated, this stress was less than the yield, that means we are okay. Okay? If the stress that we calculated was larger than the yield, that means it is unsafe. But it doesn't mean it's going to fail right away because from what, you, from what we took before on the stress strain curve, there is still like a margin that the stress is going to go beyond the yield. But we don't do that because we don't like the plastic deformation that's going to happen. But there is still room that the material or the column can have before failing. But when it fails, it's going to be something like this, which is if I applied, for example, compression to this very small column, if it's very strong enough, it's going to crush. And when it yields, we call it crush. Okay? So that's how it crush. That's why it's weird to find a column that fails or any structure element that fails because we don't even design on the ultimate that will the failure happen. We don't design on this. We don't even design on the yield. We design on something less, which we take factor of safety two or three. So to have a column that not only went beyond the design stress, it went beyond the yield, went beyond the ultimate, that's questionable. That's why when any structure element or even mechanical element fails, there is something wrong. And that's why they need to go to do, like, to do some jail time. Okay? But for the same column, like I have a same cross section, but I only increase, I only increase the length, okay? Again, I applied a huge load here. I'm not applying the same load now here. I'm applying just 10% of what I did here in that column. At 10% only, what's happening to that column? It's buckling. So we didn't even reach the yield. We didn't even reach the design stress that we wanted. No, we are even very, very low. And this very low stress caused a huge deflection. That's unstable. You don't want to have your column just like bend like that so that the building is going to fail. Although the material is safe, I mean, like, you don't see the material crushed or anything. What you saw that you, you saw like a huge deflection. So this is what we call buckling. And buckling, as I said, it is not due to the, like the material thing. It's not a material, just like how you use the shape. It's like, it, it is like instability that happens. So this loss of instability that occurs when we apply that, when we apply a compressive load and this buckling going to happen when we reach a certain critical value. And this certain critical value we call PCR or FCR, which is the critical load. So, for example, if you see the timeline, I don't, I'm not applying any load. I'm applying very small load now. And once I reach this critical value, that's when crazy things happen. A very small stresses now will cause a huge deflection. And that's what we call the buckling, and it's because of this critical value. And this critical value, we call it PCR or FCR. We're going to define it in details now in a moment. This causes a change in the shape of the element. Like what you see here. You don't want this to happen. For example, 
this column here, you didn't see that this column break. It is just buckling, but still it's considered a failure. Although you don't see like the, the steel tear apart or anything, but this is already a failure. But this one, when you not only, I mean, you design the column and you are designing for some stress, for example, here, okay? You're designing in this stress, but this design stress gonna be interrupted by this buckling because 0.1% of this, it will cause the, the column to buckle. And you didn't even design on the buckle, you designed on more. So it will go more, more, more until you see this kind of failure. Any questions so far? So here is the two modes of failure that I explained in a moment. The yield, when I apply compression and nothing happened, there is no buckling, but it will take stress until it crushes in the middle. Or the other failure, when I apply load and the column just deflects. So when does the column buckle and when it yields? So we have two mode failures here. So we got in this lecture, we're going to design the column to not fail in both modes. So we're going to design on them. So who came up with the equation? His Euler. You, of course, know him. But be before that, we have a column. And this is his classic Euler column. So this classic Euler column, and pay attention to this, because this equation is based on this shape, where we, when we, where we have two pins or two hinges at the end. And when we apply P, it buckles. OK? And it buckles like this. Some of you might see that it looks like a bending. And the difference here between, for example, a beam, and before, we, when we applied load like this, and this load is perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam, before we agreed, it bent like that. We were able to find the bending moment. We were able to find the deflection. But what is new here, and when we apply a maximum, a, an axial load, it is also buckling, and it looks like a bending. So we're going to use the same, the same ideas, or like the concepts that we use in the deflection, where if I have a pen, the pen does allow theta, which means you have a rotation here. And you have a rotation at the end. That's how it bent like this. So we're going to use the same formula because it is a bending, but it's not due to forces that's perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the beam. It is due to the axial force. So it's basically bending due to axial force. So this equation. He came up after doing a differential equation, and I would love to prove it to you, but we don't have time. So it is in the reference. You're going to find it easy, but let me give you the equation. So the P critical, or the force critical, which is the maximum force above which the material buckle, or the column buckle, it is equal to E square. No, it is pi square times E, which is the modulus of elasticity, times I over the length square. So what does this tell you? This tells you if I increase the length, if I increase the length, the buckling load is going to be less. And the buckling load, the, the low buckling load here is so bad. Because if I have a low buckling load, that means with a minimum, with a minimum load, it's going to buckle. And sometimes when we have a very, very, I mean, like if I have the same, this column, and I had it's like double height, or like I increase the length by double or triple, it might buckle due to its own weight. I didn't apply any load. By its own weight, it can already buckle. So the buckling load, or the P critical, is inversely proportional with the square of the length. If you notice here, I do have a moment of inertia, because basically, this is bending, right? And what was the factor that we used to resist the bending? That was the moment of inertia. That's why, no, thickness is for the shear. Moment of inertia is for the bending, because moment of inertia is the bending. Same as this. So I have the same, same height, OK? One of them 
has, of course, smaller inertia than the other. That's why when I apply compression here, it buckles. But for the same column, for this same rectangle cross section, I increase the length a little bit. And when I apply a load, same load, it's hard for me to buckle. They have the same length, but what I did now, I increased the inertia. So th these are the two ways to, for example, prevent the buckling, which is the reducing a length or increasing the inertia. And also, you can play with the material. If I replaced, for example, this guy with a steel, of course, it's not going to buckle like this. It's going to be a little bit harder to buckle. But the thing is, when I tell you you need to reduce the length to prevent buckling, sometimes we need to have a column in this height, for example. So I can't reduce the length. I need to keep the length. But sh what should we do? What should we do for the length here? Let me define it. This is the distance. Let me say, this is, let me call instead of distance, I will say this is unsupported length. What do I mean with unsupported length? If I have a column like this, and I added two pins at the end, where is the unsupported length? It is this length, right? Because what we're going to introduce now, if you go to the gym, you're going to find something like this, right? I do have a column, but in one direction, which I'm going to explain in a moment, in one direction, you have a beam at the mid-span, right? This beam at the mid-span reduced the unsupported length, right? So in this direction, like in the away direction, and instead of taking this whole, it's, it's, it's six meter, and the whole six meter, instead of taking the whole six meter, now the unsupported length is only three meters, OK? So this is one way to reduce the unsupported length by just adding, for example, a beam. So let me go back. Here is the p-critical. But what I, this, this definition is not complete because what you saw here, you saw this cross-section. We have y, which is the longitudinal axis, and then we have x. What you saw that we can bend this, if I use the, a weaker one, we can bend this around the y. But it also can bend around the x, but it's hard to buckle around the x. OK? It is hard. And the reason why it's hard, can anyone tell me why it is easy to buckle around the y, but not the x, from, for example, this cross section? For what? OK. The inertia. So yeah, the inertia. So for example, bending or buckling this column around the x is harder because now we have b times h cubed over 12. The h here, or this length, is cubed. But in the other direction, we have b, and then we have h. And this h is so small, that's why it's easy to buckle that way. So what I'm going to introduce now, we're going to have a p critical in the x direction, or around the x. So we need to use the ix now. And the length, we need to use the length in the x direction. So this column can buckle around the x. Let me draw it here, which is hardly going to happen. So we have a buckling this way, which is around the x. So we need to use the length in the x direction. And the other equation, which is the same equation and same everything, but instead of using x, now I'm going to use y. y, y, and here y, and that's y. OK? So it can buckle that way. So here is the length in the y direction. But some of you might ask me, isn't the lx is equal to ly? Then why didn't you differentiate between them? The reason why, sometimes like the example that I show you in the gym, that we can put a beam in one direction, but not in the other. Which means, in this direction, the ly now is divided. So now, my unsupported length is going to be l over 2. 
around the y direction. But what about here around the x direction? What length should I take? The whole length. Do you see? Any questions? All good? OK. Let's move on. And let's define some terms here. If we apply the load, and this load is less than the critical load, this is what we call stable equilibrium. OK? Which means that by applying a load, we might not see it from here, but there might be a lateral deflection. But that lateral deflection is not as huge as that one. So it is still um, stable equilibrium. When we have P is equal to PCR, that's what we call neutral equilibrium. So it's neither equilibrium nor, nor unequilibrium. Because any sudden change, any very small sudden change that's going to happen is going to destroy everything. That's why we don't like the neutral equilibrium, neither the unstable equilibrium. Because of course, if we have the load greater than the PCR, that's when we have the unstable equilibrium. So here's the thing. The compressive load cannot be increased beyond the critical value unless the column is laterally strained. And what I mean with laterally strained here by adding, for example, this is bending that way. I need to put a beam horizontally so that, can you see how it's bending now? What is, do you see the, the two parabolas that happen? So now I reduced the unsupported length. So that's what it means it's laterally strained by either putting a beam or sometimes we can put like some sort of bracing, for example. So it's, if it's bending that way, I can put bracing so it can prevent. And that's why you see like the two, the two parabola thing. It's, so it's, it is something like for this guy, it's going to bend something like this or buckle something like this. Do you all see it? OK. So now you know how to prevent buckling. And for example, if you saw a case like this, so when you want to replace this column, you, can, you know what should you do. OK? You can be creative, or you can use the traditional stuff. OK, what I said now to prevent the buckling, or to reduce the buckling, we can play with the length. We can add a beam in the middle. We can play with the material. We can play with the moment of inertia. But what is missing now is the boundary condition. So if I have pin pin at both ends, you all see that the parabola goes all the way from, the, from up to down. But if I fix it from both ends, and by saying fix it, I mean I'm disallowing a rotation at both ends, and I'm applying compression, that, the, do you see that you, do you have a same parabola or less parabola? Less. So here what we're going to do now, and this like deflection or this buckling, same as the deflection, so it's not anything new here. So if you have a pin pin and we applied a compression, this column is going to buckle like this. And here is the unsupported length, which is L. And here is the way it buckles. So now let's step by step try to modify the end conditions. So now I'm adding fix at the one side and leaving the pen at the other side. So adding a fixation, that means I'm disallowing rotation here. And at some point, at distance, it's going to rotate like this, or like going to buckle like this. OK? Like what you see here. If I'm fixing this, I'm allowing rotation. That's why you see it is going straight, then it's buckle, and there is an angle here, but there is no angle here. So here is the length, the unsupported length. And here, from here to here, I'm introducing a new term which is called LE. So LE here is the effective length. And this effective length has a couple definition. And one of the definition is that Euler at the beginning conclude his equation based on the pen pen. So LE going to be, OK, 
how much of this parabola from the pin pin do you see here? So if I have a fixity and pin, I'm going to see 70%, which is 0.7 of the L, which is, if you want to know the definition, it's the length of an equivalent pin pin classic Euler column. So this is an equivalent length. It's 0.7. Another definition to it, it is the distance between the inflection point, which means the distance between when the deflection changes its curvature. So you have a curvature that started like this and then went like that. So you have a concavity that way and concavity here the other way. So the distance from here to the end, that's your effective length. Why do we need to do that effective length? Because we want to generalize the peak critical equation so that it can cover the other conditions. So now instead of saying pi squared ei over l squared, I'm not going to say l squared now. I'm going to say le squared, which is the effective length. And from the pin pin case, the length is equal to le, of course, because that's the, the reference that we're going to use. That's why if, we, if I went back up to the pr, if instead of saying l, it is le, I did nothing, because L is equal to LE in the case of the pen pen, or the length of the, of the buckling. If I change the fixed T now, by having both ends are fixed, now it's going to go like this, and it buckles, and the length here or the LE here going to be 50% of the L, which is, I'm going to say, 0.5 L. And here is the whole L, which is the distance or the unsupported length. Is that clear so far? Any questions? OK. The last one is a little bit tricky, because if I have fixed the fix at one side and free at the other side, it's going to rotate or going to deflect something like this, OK? That's the buckling shape. So here comes the, the tricky part. What is the equivalent length for that shape? If I want to re relate this to the pen pen, which is the reference that we have, we want to create this full parabola in here. So to create this full parabola, you're gonna, you need to extend an imaginary line like this down here to create the full parabola as if it is the pen pen condition. That's why the LE here, the effective length, gonna be twice the L, which tells you that the last case here, the fixed free side or the fixed free condition, that's the weaker column that you're gonna have. So all these terms that I said, which is, for example, L is equal to LE for pen pen. So the constant here is 1. The LE here is equal to 0.7 L. So the constant here is 0.7. For fixed fix, the constant here is 0.5. And for fixed free, the constant here is 2. And these constants, we call them K. So those are k factors, OK? And if I want to re rewrite the PR equation to be generalized, so I can say either pi squared EI over LE squared, or I can say, and instead of LE, I'm going to say KL, which tells you also that LE, which is the effective length, is equal to k times l. k depends on the end condition and the l, which is the unsupported length of the column. Is that clear? OK. Let's, let's do some, like, to, like a summary here. So I do have a k factor, and I do have a PCR, or let's say FCR, because I'm going to use it both interchangeably here. So starting with the reference case, if I have a pen pen for a same column length and for a same cross section, I have 
pi square ei over le square for the same column, for same everything. And when I calculated this, for example, I found it that it's 10 kips. That means you can't go beyond 10 kips. 10 kips is your maximum. If you went beyond the 10 kips, you're going to see a very huge lateral deflection. So what if now I change the pen pen to fix free? You're going to put 2 here, so 2L. So the 2 is going to be squared, which is 4. And 1 over 4 is 0 0.25. As if I'm saying 0 0.25 times 10, because this is the original position, now you have 2.5 kips. So you reduce the capacity of the column from a 10 in pin pin to 2.5. So this is like you're disrespecting the column because you're not using the whole strength of the column. You are abusing the column. Like you can call it that way. What if we went to the fixed pin? So fixed pin, we're going to put 0.7 down here. And the 0.7 is going to be squared. So 1 over 0.27 squared, which is 2.5. 04, which is now you increase the capacity of the column to 20.4 kips. And the stronger case, which is fix fix, if I said 0.5 square here and 1 over 0.5 square, that's how we end up with the 4. And now you have a 40 kips. So it is your choice to have a, cap a column capacity of 2.5 kips or the 40 kips. And of course, everything comes with the price. That's why you're going to take in the design classes when to use which. Is that clear? Any questions? So I introduced the LX and LY before. So let's move to this example, which is the gem example. So instead of 3 meter, I think it should be 6 meter. So one case here where you have a column that is pin at both sides, OK? Do you see any restraints at any side? No. So when you find the p-critical, you're going you're gonna to take the whole length for the both p-critical. You can do both equations, p-critical in x and p-critical in y. But can any of you tell me which p-critical should we eliminate before calculating both of them? You can calculate both of them. But if you notice something between both of them, you can elim eliminate one of them. Which one should you take? Which one is more critical? Taking the big critical about, for example, this is an I section. This column is an I section. For an I section, you already know that the X direction is stronger than the Y direction, right? For example, if I showed you in the table, this is the I section table. For example, for any W, for example, this is W27, by 178. And here is the x direction. Here is the y direction. So the moment of inertia about x is 6,990. And around the y direction is 555. So of course, the moment of inertia about x is larger than the y. That's why I'm going to ask you again, which direction is more critical to buckling? Is it the x or y? Y, that's correct. So the buckling. If you have the same condition in both sides, the buckling is going to be critical in the weaker dimension. Because always the, always the column is going to buckle in the weaker direction, not in the strong direction. It can't buckle that way. It's hard to buckle that way. You can, if you notice that there is a side that's stronger than the other, then you can do the peak critical for the weaker, dimension, weaker side. But if you didn't notice, it's OK. Calculate the peak critical twice, and you're going to find the lowest is going to be in the weaker direction. This guy, you have pin, pin, for example, and the restraint is pinned here. So in that direction, you're going to take, this is the unsupported length, for example, 3 meters. But the effective length for the 3 meters now, it's going to be 1 times 3. But if I fixed in one side, now I do have, instead of 1 times 3, I will have 0 0.7 times 3. Is that clear? But that in the restrained side. 
But in the other side, which is like in the direction of this girl, you have a buckling, like the whole length gonna buckle in that direction. And that's when the L here you need to take equal to the whole six meters. Is that clear what length to take? Any questions? Okay. So we need to classify the column because we have a couple mode of failures here. We have the column might crush, which is due to the yield, which is called crushing failure, and it can buckle. So that's like a buckling failure. So what happens, I mean, like how to classify the column? So here when the column is tall and thin, it's going to, we call this long column or cylinder column. And this the mode of failure that will control this column, we call it buckling failure. But if we have short and wide column, we call it a short column, and that's like the expression for it. And the mode of failure that's going to dominate this, we call it crushing failure. But here comes the question. How can we say a tall column is a tall and a short column is a short? We need to have some metric here. So that's why we, need, we, we are introducing here something we call cylinderness ratio. And this is basically tells us the tendency of the column to buckle. And this cylindricity ratio, let's say SR, or in the codes, for example, it is gamma, it is the LE over R. So the R here is the radius of gyration, which is equal to square root I over area. Okay, if the R is big enough, that means the column is strong against buckling. If R is small, that means the, the column is weak against buckling. And we can use this buck, the, the radius of gyration in the P critical equation. So P critical is equal to pi square EI over LE square, right? That's the P-critical. But if I want to find the stresses, for example, the sigma-critical, I'm going to define, I'm going to divide the P-critical over area because stress equals force over area and the, the compression is a normal force. So that's why I divide it over area. Tell me. Sigma-critical? Sigma it is the critical stress. It is like instead of having PR as a force now, I'm just defining it as a stress. So if I want to find the critical stress, because I might ask you, what is the critical force? So if I ask you the critical force, you're going to use the PCR. But if I find, told you what is the critical stress, you just basically find the PCR and just divide it over area. But what I want to do now is if I said PCR over area, then I need to add an area here. Okay? And since you know that the radius of gyration, it is square root I over area. If I said R square, that's when I have I over A. So I over A here, as if I'm saying, instead of putting the A down, I'm going to put it up here, and I'm going to put the division sign, which means I can remove the I over area and put the R square here. Or I can put the R square down, and it will be in this bracket, which is LE over R. And this slenderness ratio is important because it tells us the tendency to buckle. So whenever we design column in the future or your mechanical element, in the codes, for example, if you have the LE over R, I'm not going to ask you in this, just like for your information. If you found the effective length over the radius of gyration less than 32, that's when your column is short column. And that's when you know that the yielding is the governing mode of failure. But if I have between 32 and 120, that's medium cylinder column. Greater than 120, that's cylinder column or long column. Of course, each of these three has different design equation. Okay? Because you already know now that this one is going to fail in yielding. So we have a large capacity here. This one is going to fail in buckling. So in the design equation, you're going to reduce the, str the, the strength so much so that the column, you can find like a very gigantic column, tall column, very gigantic, and at the end, you barely see any loads up there. But why it got this whole cross-section? 
because of you want to resist the buckling. OK? Any questions? So this won't be on our test, or just the knowing? No, this is just for your information. This is like in the codes. For example, when we design column to, to choose which equation to use, we need to first of all see what is the mode of failure that's controlling here. Yeah, the area is the cross-section area. OK. Let's continue. So to have some sense also between the stress, the critical stress, and the, the slenderness ratio, which is the L effective over radius of gyration. For example, if I have a very, very tall column, very tall column, very, very large, that's when you will have a very small critical stress. So if I have a very tall column, that's when I have a very small critical stress here. So it's going to fail right away. And if I have a very short column, like even shorter than this, that's when I'm going to have, it's, it's barely going to fail in the, in, the, in the buckling. So it's going to go to infinity, for example. So the curve goes like this. Between the slenderness ratio and the sigma critical. If I have a very tall column, that's when you barely have stresses. So it's like going to fail right away. But if you have a very short column, the stress is going to go to infinity. But there is something that need to limit this diagram, which is the sigma yield. And it's going to cross this diagram, which is going to make, make the ends here are dotted lines. And here is the curve. This horizontal line is the yield, which is the limit. We can't design the column to resist like infinity loads. There is a limit at which the column is going to uh, crush, which is the yield, which depends on the material. OK? So if you design the column in this region, that means you are doing a short column. If you are designing a column in this region, for example, that's like a medium cylinder column. And the last side here, that's called a long column. Long column means it is affected by the critical buckling. But here, it's not affected by buckling anymore. What is controlling here, what is the, the roof here, is the yield. Anywhere here, it is just a critical buckling or like the buckling stress. Any questions? All good? OK. So let's move to the examples now. So the question asks you, find the allowable load for the following cantilever column. And cantilever, it is always fixed free. Because it's fixed from one side, free at the other side. So now you know the condition here. And the k for, fix, for the fixed free is equal to what? 2. So now I found the first thing. And then the question continues to ask me, determine the maximum allowable load for the following cantilever column based on the yielding and the buckling. And even if I didn't ask you about the yielding or the buckling, that's the two mode of failure that controls the column, and you need to check it regardless. So I will start by doing the yielding, because I want to find the maximum load. So I will find, first of all, a load from a yielding, and then I'm going to find a load from the buckling and see which one controls. And that's the design that I'm going to use. So for yielding, it is not new. The yielding stress is equal to force over area, right? So the yielding is given in the question. The yield of this column is 35 KSI. The load is unknown because I want to find the load or the controlling load. The area is given, which is 150 inches square. If you did this, you're going to find that the load equal to 5,250 kips. OK? Is this the design load? No. You need to check for the buckling. And since this column is circular, as you know, Ix is equal to Iy. That's why we are given here only one moment of inertia. So the buckling is going to be P 
P critical, or you can say F critical, is equal to pi square EI over LE square. And LE, it is K times L. So here comes the first question. What is the unsupported length? Not the, not the, not the effective length, the unsupported length. That's correct, which is the, the length of the column. That's the unsupported length. I have supported from one side here, and then that's the L, which is the unsupported length. But now the effective length, it's going to be 2 times that. So I'm going to say pi square times modulus of a cysty, which is 12,000, times moment of inertia, which is 750. And then I'm going to say 2 times 60 and the whole thing square. Common mistake that you don't square the two. You just put the two outside. OK? So don't forget to put everything in, inside these brackets. If you did this, you're going to find that the P is equal to 6168.5. And here comes a question to you. Which load, as a designer, you can use? Do you, will you use the 5,000 or the 6,000? 5,000. Because if you went beyond the 5,000, if you designed the column, for example, on 5,500, it's going to crush on you. And here comes another question. What is the failure mode of this column? Is it, is it going to crush or is it going to buckle? It's going to crush because it's going to crush first before it reaches the buckling. Is that clear? OK, let's move to the, the second question, so which is similar to like the gym column. I do have an I section, and I do have a column. And again, it is restrained from one side, not both sides. It's important to understand that. OK, so here the question asks you, determine the allowable stress, not the load, stress, for the column. And it's constrained, again, it's buckling in the weak direction. Here, they are so nice to tell us where is the weak direction. But you can easily tell what, what, what is the weak direction by looking at the IX and IY. The IX is 82 and IY is 18. So obviously, around X is harder to buckle compared to Y. OK? So now again, the same steps. If I want to find the allowable stress to design this column against, I'm going to check the yielding first. So if I check the yielding, the yielding is given in the question, which is equal to 50 KSI. So I'm just going to write it down. So that's my yielding stress. OK? For the buckling, and let's, let's do something extra here. So if I know that the yielding stress here is equal to 50, if I want to find just the load, I'm going to say 50 times the area. I'm going to get 354 kips. This is just an extra. The asas for the stress, not the force. But I'm just like doing the force just to show you, just to, to compare them. Now, let's do the buckling. For the buckling here, I do have an I section. So the IX doesn't equal to IY. So that's why I need to use buckling about X once and buckling about Y again. So I will say, Buckling about x first, and then I'm going to say buckling around y. OK, let's now just put the equation and do some plug and chug. So I'm going to find the p critical first, and then I'm going to divide the p critical over area to get the stress. But let's find the force first. I'm having pi square e i x, x over effective length in x direction square. So now you tell me what values to use. So for modulus of a cysty, it's given. It is 29,000 KSI. What i, x, what i should I use? It's obviously i, x. So this, this one is easy. What about the l, e, x? So here it's, it is z, but let me write it in x. So you have an x and you have a y, which is this guy here, x, this guy here is y. So buckling about x, what length should I use? It is pen, 
happen. Anyone? 70.5? How did you get that? So you have about x, you have this whole length, right? So you're going to take this whole length, which is 17.5 plus 17.5. Yeah, the k, no, the k, you're going to multiply by k, but what is the k for pin pin? One. So I'm going to say 35. So let's say if one of those was fixed, then how would you do that? If so if one of them is fixed? So you're going to still, first of all, dl not going to change. dl is still going to be 35. But the k here for the fixed end is 0 0.7 from the table that I showed you here. OK, here, here comes this part. So you are saying that what if you have a fix in one side and a pin in the other side? And it's a common, it's, it's happened in real life, but not like in this example, which means if I'm putting a big, a big column this way, and it has a limitation in a code, what to consider fixed, what to consider pin. If I have a very big beam here, sorry, in a column, in this direction it's fixed. But if I have a very small beam, like the one in the gem, we call it pin. But again, if you have fixed in one direction and pin in the other direction, again, it's, it's not that hard. Let's say it is fixed from here. So this is going to be 35 times 0 0.7. And if it's pin from the other side and pin from the other side, then you have 35 times 1. Because you're going to have two separate equations. So you're going to put each side in, in a separate equation. OK? So let's now say both sides are pin pin. And in around the x direction, so this is x, it's going to buckle like this. That's why I'm taking 35. Going to multiply by 12 to convert it to inches. And then times 1, and this one is the k. And the whole thing is square. If you did this, you're going to find that the peak critical is equal to 134 kips. But I'm not asking you about the load. I'm asking you about the stress. So you're going to basically just say sigma, sigma critical x equal to PCR x over the area, which is 134 over 7.08. You're going to get 18.97 KSI. Is that clear? Bless you. Let's do this again in the y direction. And I'm going to have all of you to tell me what number should I use. And instead of x, now it's going to be y. Okay, the IY, what is the value for IY? 18.3. What is the LE effective length in the Y direction? So you first of all identify where is, I, where is Y, which is here, and then draw how it's going to buckle. So now let's start first. What is the L? 17.5, okay. Multiply by 12 to convert it to inches. What about the... K. And always the bracing, it is pin. What K should I use? 1. So I have 17.5, 12 over 1. I have another question. What if the bracing is not placed right at the middle? If it's placed, for example, here. And then it divided this to, for example, 20 and 15. What L should you use? I, I heard 20. OK. If you have a large L, what is the load going to happen? It's going to decrease. No, the larger one. No, the small one going to increase your capacity. But the large L going to reduce, again, if I increase the L, if I increase the length, I am, the buckling is going to control, right? But if I reduce the L, I barely have buckling. That's why if we placed the beam, 
so that I have 20 and I have 15. And again, if you don't see it, you can do the both. You can do two equations here, one with the 20 and one with the 15, and then you can figure it out yourself. But it's important to understand that larger L at the denominator here going to reduce the PCR, which is redu going to reduce the capacity. Is that clear to everyone? OK. Let me erase this, because we don't have 20. I'm sorry, I'm two minutes. But like, let me write it again. Last thing. So the critical value here, it is equal to 118.73 kips. And if I want to find sigma critical, just say 118.7 over the area, and you're going to get 16.77 KSI. And here comes the question. What should you use? You have 50 in yielding, and you have 18.97 in the x direction, and 16.77 in y direction. What stress should you design this column on? 16.77. Although I restrain the y, but this, this, this um, how do you say, restriction, I mean, I, I don't want to say it's not enough, but it, of course, reduced to what was it uh, before to 16.77. So now you understand why we took the 16.77, right? OK, any questions? And that's all. Now I'll see you tomorrow.